This was a tremendous moment of solidarity. When some of the provinces are struggling, uh, we're all there. We're, we're going to be there. We support them. We have their back. The provinces have shown that we can unite and work together to come to consensus, if you will, on these critical issues. And I respectfully would ask that our Prime Minister and the federal government now work with the leaders at this table. We look to Ottawa where there's a minority government. I find, and I think my colleagues in the minority situations would agree, that this is a unique opportunity for us to work together. This was the first meeting of the country's premiers since the federal election in October, an election that exposed a lot of regional differences in this country. The CBC's David Cochran was covering the meeting alongside me. David, a, a different context, different mm. backdrop against which this meeting happened, and it sort of resulted in a few very tangible things coming out of it. Yeah, I think what's interesting here with these meetings, you get 13 premiers, 13 agendas on one morning to kind of sort it all out and get on the same page. And I think they did a pretty good job in the time they had of coming up with a very clear and focused list of, of issues they want to deal with with the Prime Minister because if it's a clear small list it kind of forces Justin Trudeau to engage with you on those. So they want to focus on economic development, the fiscal stabilization program, deal with transfers especially in health and in infrastructure and with a focus on northern development and I think there are a couple of things there. Uh, it's a clear focus for the meeting with the Prime Minister that will happen sometime in the new year so they have a clear agenda as opposed to a sprawling communique of 14, 15, 16 things like you often see and they have agreement on something that can help Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland and Labrador, the oil producing provinces that are really struggling, and that is a demand to change the fiscal stabilization program. Now, a lot of people haven't heard of this, a, a little known and little used They'll program. They'll know now, yeah. They'll know now, because it's going to be a, a big request, because what it essentially is is a program where the federal government subsidizes any provincial government that has a big drop in its revenues from one year to the next due to an economic slump. It's not like equalization, it is, it is almost like an emergency relief fund. Uh, the problem with it is that it's capped, and there's a limit to how high it can go, and the cap. $60 dollars per person. And that's a cap that was put in place in the late 1980s. No adjustment for inflation over, you know, decades. So it, it's artificially low right now. And Alberta and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador think this is a way that they can get the help they need in their economic difficulties. And it takes the conversation off equalization because equalization is a fixed pot of money. If you tweak that to give money to someone else, it has to come from another province. That was causing way too much tension and conflict at the provincial level. Agreeing on the fiscal stabilization program lets them have a united ask of the federal government without causing tensions here. So they found a way to simplify their demands and move past equalization to focus on something that can help Jason Kenney, Scott Moe, and Dwight Ball. I think Alberta was saying they get something like $250 million yeah. from that program, so this will be welcome news. We're talking to Premier Kenney in a moment. Yeah. Uh, another issue, health care. You talked about health care. That was mm -hmm. one of the things that came out of the meeting. They're asking for essentially more money from the federal government. What didn't seem to get a lot of consensus, though, was the idea of pharmacare. Tell yeah. me more about so that. So this is interesting. Like, so they're all on board on wanting more health money from the federal government breaking news came out. <laughs> the provinces want more cash. You know, it's a 3% increase each year. They want it to go to 5.2%. That's only two percentage points, but that's billions of dollars over years as it adds up. Uh, where there isn't consensus is on pharmacare. We know this is sort of the big thing the Liberals put in the window during the election campaign, though it was not very well fleshed out. They want to take right. steps towards a national pharmacare program. You saw Dwight Ball in Newfoundland and Labrador say, yeah, let's have this conversation. We've got an old population with chronic disease. This is a big cost challenge for us. Let's move in that direction. Brian Pallister saying, you know what? We've got hallway medicine. We got ankle and knee replacements. Before we expand healthcare, let's fix what we got. And Legault saying, "Well, everyone should be able to opt out." That's the number one thing he wants because they already have a pharmacare program in Quebec. So Trudeau doesn't have a very clear plan that he has presented to the country. They have an aspirational plan. Uh, if you're looking for consensus at this table, it just wasn't there. I mean, there was a much more cordial tone uh, at the premier's tables, what everyone tells us inside. But on this one, it's just like when it comes to healthcare, there's a much bigger priority at the provincial level than a federally promised. Uh, pharmacare program, which is going to be interesting with the minority parliament, right? Because Very Jagmeet Singh has said this is a precondition for his support on anything. Speech, yeah. Exactly. So how does Trudeau move ahead with, I wouldn't call them unwilling partners, but it's an unclear partnership at this point. Before I let you go, tell yeah. me if you had the same impression as me, especially at the press conference that the premiers gave after. I noticed a real, I think more than I've noticed at other meetings of the premiers, desire on the premiers, part, or more disciplined, I guess, way of exerting themselves where they really tried hard not to talk about anything. Yeah. that could cause disagreement. By that I mean Bill 21, the secularism law in Quebec. Yeah. Silence, essentially, after Doug Ford said, oh, we're just here to talk about common ground. And I think the reporter said, anybody else? And it, it was silence. Pipelines, 
very little discussion. Yeah, they all agree with natural resource development. It's just which natural resource <laughs> are you talking about and how would they be developed? But this is the whole thing. I mean, it, 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 one of the themes of their meetings with Justin Trudeau, the ones that have happened one on one, was if you want to change big national programs, go back and find unanimity at the provincial level. They're going to find it on these four issues, right? So this is what they've done. They want to find unanimity there. They don't want to leave any openings where they can be divided and splintered or where the federal government can point at them and say, you don't agree on these things. And Bill 21, which was such a major issue in the federal campaign, they just don't want to, there's a lot of tension there with Manitoba running ads in Quebec. Brian Pallister trying to woo Quebec public servants away to move to Manitoba. They're trying to minimize conflict here. We heard like Kenny was kind of not conflict oriented when he first came in in, in July, but you know, in, Saskatoon was going to be like summer camp for the resistance. This is a much more conciliatory <laughs> yeah, they meeting. All, they all said they didn't even know it would be called the resistance. Yeah, yeah, that no. famous They're McLean's coverage. They're all McLean's of blaming yeah, Photoshop. All of a sudden. But, but they, they want to go, they, they know they've got a prime minister now in a minority situation. So a diminished and weakened prime minister someone they think they can leverage if they stay united and keep it focused and that's what this is about and they don't want any divisions on non-priority issues weakening uh, their stance as they go into this first minister's meeting that's either gonna happen in, in January or February all right thanks David appreciate all your analysis the CBC's David Cochran as I mentioned this is the first time the premiers met since the federal election in that election the liberals were shut out of both Alberta and Saskatchewan that has led to Alberta premier Jason Kenney making some very specific asks of the federal government talking about what he calls a fair deal for Alberta. We spoke to Premier Kenny a little bit earlier today. Have a listen. Hi, Premier Kenny. Hello. Nice to see you. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Welcome to Ontario. Uh, I wanted to start off with something that you said in the press conference following the meeting that particularly struck me, and it was around the idea of people around the table, other premiers, having your back. And you were referencing specifically, or having Albertans back, you were referencing specifically the proposed changes to the fiscal stabilization program. Can you uh, outline for me how significant you think it is that there was consensus on that today, given the context over the last month and the sure. outcome of the federal election? Well, you know, it, it, it was very important to me because uh, every premier comes to a meeting like this with an infinite list of their own issues and priorities, and we could have spent all day trying to jam, to jam put together a 10 point, 10 page, I mean, communique with every issue under the sun, but instead we decided to be very focused. Mm -hmm. And, and, and effectively three themes plus northern issues for the territories. One of the three was reforming the fiscal stabilization program, something most folks have never even heard of before, but has suddenly become very important for Alberta, Sask, and Newfoundland because um, it, it, it's basically, it's a kind of like a reverse equalization yeah. for half provinces when they have a sudden decline in, re in revenues. We should have gotten a couple of billion dollars from this over the past five years. Instead, we got 250 mm -hmm. million. And I don't like begging both federalism, I really don't. Uh, but my goodness, we contribute over $20 billion a year net to the rest of the Federation. We've got a jobs crisis, a fiscal crisis. This was a, an expression of solidarity by premiers from coast to coast saying we understand you're going through a really tough time and this is one way we can show some help. Was there any hesitancy on the part of other premiers or was it an easy consensus to arrive at? On that point it, it was shockingly uh, easy. Uh, there was some advanced work. Uh, Premier Mo and I worked the, the phones with our colleagues beforehand explaining this uh, and I think that Premier Ball probably helped explain it to, to some of his colleagues on the East Coast. Um, but I really want to thank especially uh, Quebec and Ontario um, for for understanding the situation because it's hard to get anything through the Council of the Federation without the two big provinces being on side. Did you, um, I guess, do you have any, any idea or in your conversations with Minister Freeland or the Prime Minister, have you seen any openness or willingness on the part of the federal government to comply with this request already? Uh, well, I had a very good meeting for almost three hours with Deputy Prime Minister Freeland in Edmonton last week and I thought it was the most uh, it, it expressed a great deal of openness to a number of our requests for fairness and this was one of them. I, she certainly didn't say no and indeed um, we've received a letter from Minister Morneau uh, about the fiscal stabilization setting the number for for this past year but telling us that, that he's open to discussing it at uh, the December 14th Minister of Finance meeting of finance ministers in Ottawa. So we believe there is an opening of the door um, and 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 we just we just appreciate that more importantly to have 13 provinces and territories saying they support Alberta. I think this is an important symbolic message. I've been saying to frustrated Albertans that we are not isolated. We are not alone. We have a lot of friends across the country who recognize we've played an oversized role in fiscal federalism and the in the economy. And today was a good concrete example Your of that. Your critics say you've done the opposite. That instead you're out there saying 
you know, we're not getting a fair deal and well, trying to, and tr but but saying it in a way that riles up the emotions that you and I both know are very real in the province. Uh, what do you say to your critics? Who say I, I that? say that the worst thing I could do in my position would be to uh, deny or diminish uh, the the frustration that exists in, in uh, amongst Albertans. And the frustration comes from this. They they, by the way. Please, folks need to understand, Alberta has changed dramatically in the past, let's say, two or three decades. Our population doubled in 30 years, mainly by folks coming from other parts of Canada. So it's a province made up of Canadians from every corner and immigrants from abroad. And, 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 and those folks have bought into the Alberta idea. Hard work, an entrepreneurial economy based in part on resources. We, we don't mind paying tens of billions into the Federation. We just want the right to get our resources to market, get a fair price for it. Then they, they saw Northern Gateway cancelled, what happened to Energy East, the delays on TMX and KXL, C69, C48, all the rest of it. And they say, what's going on? Like, we're helping to pay the bills here. Why can't we get a fair deal? This demonstrates that parts of the, the rest of the country at least understands that basic uh, frustration. I want to ask you about the ask for health care that came out of this on the communique as well. Essentially, and I know I'm simplifying it, but provinces are asking for more money to be transferred from the federal government to the provincial governments for health care. If that does happen, if the federal government does comply, will that money on the part of Alberta go towards ensuring that, you know, as the headlines read this weekend, 500 nurses don't lose their jobs? Will it go towards the front lines? Um, well, yes. Uh, we are not actually cutting health care. We're, we're actually increasing it by $200 million. 1% compared to the three, I think, that was anticipated. Is that right, which is, which is not going to be easy. Still less. But we have the most expensive health system in the country. We spend 20% more on health than other provinces, even though we have the youngest population, and we have lower than average uh, life expectancy, higher than average infant mortality, and longer than average surgical wait time. So we have some real inefficiencies in the system. And we need our unions to work with us to get at those inefficiencies. Is cutting nursing positions help We don't want times? to. We don't want to. And, and that was a maximum possible. And we, we'd be primarily through attrition. It would be over four years. But we don't need to do that if the unions help us to reduce some of the benefits and, 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 and costs that uh, people in the private sector and in other provinces do not have. So like we what? want Well, like... There's a, there's a very significant reliance on overtime uh, amongst our nurses. We have great nurses. But aren't they being called be in because there's a need for them? We actually have the by far the highest uh, per capita share of nurses in the country. So if uh, here's, the, here's our point. If other provinces can, can operate, uh, get better outcomes often in their health systems uh, at lower labor costs and 20% less spending per capita on health care with older populations, there's something that's not jiving here. We want to work with our, our public service to figure that out, but we are not cutting health care. We're actually increasing the budget. You're increasing the overall budget, but I think the, the message at least that some Albertans received this weekend is that you are uh, uh, trying to find those efficiencies on the backs of frontline workers. We're that, starting. That care could suffer, mm. and I take your point about overtime, but I've been in the health care system in Alberta, and it didn't seem like the nurses were not very busy. Right, like they're, they're, well, they're, 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 they're busy, and, uh, and we respect what they do. I, um, uh, the, the point is simply this: that that we're broke as a province. We're running the largest deficit in the country, eight billion dollars. Dr. McKinnon, former NDP, NDP finance minister, called it a fiscal crisis. We cannot just borrow ourselves into a fiscal ditch and spend billions on interest payments. Albertans are telling us they they can't afford more taxes. We have to find a way to operate at least as efficiently as other provinces do. And our public sector unions, I believe, can and should be part of that. But there's no guarantee that frontline workers won't lose their job as a result. I, I certainly hope not. And if there are any reductions, I hope it happens through attrition. But we can, hope is different than a guarantee, Well, right? the, the guarantee depends on how the unions respond to, to, to the situation. I'll tell you, our, our, most of our, many of our public sector unions are, have actually asked for wage increases next year of as much as 8%. When we're broke as a government, is this in the bargaining process. It's a, yeah. The, these, this is their request in the arbitration on what's called final wage reopeners before we get to the next collective bargaining agreements. There, many they're asking for seven or eight percent increases in one year when the average private sector family's after-tax income is down by eight percent. So this is. The, the union leadership is, I suggest, looks like they're not really in touch with the economic, fiscal, and lived reality in our province right now. Okay, one last topic before I let you go, and that is your your old job in the federal conservatives. You know you've received a lot of questions about Mr. Shear's leadership. He's receiving a lot of questions about his own leadership. You you use the term civil war this weekend, like, and I'm going to paraphrase, but something along the lines of, you know, let's not do this out in, in public. Shouldn't there be space for open dissent right now? 
there will be a, a leadership review vote uh, at the Federal Conservative Convention in April, and, and people should, of course, vote uh, based on their judgment. Um, I, I think making the, turning that into a daily side sh political sideshow is massively unhelpful. Mr. Trudeau, in many ways, lost this election. He lost the popular vote. He lost a bunch of seats. He got wiped out in a couple of provinces. He lost his majority. But you don't hear liberals gunning for Mr. Trudeau. Mr. Scheer won the largest Isn't number. Isn't that reflective of Mr. Scheer, though, rather than Mr. Trudeau? I think it's reflective of, the, of, of liberal discipline. And this is not a new thing in Canadian politics, where conservatives have had a tendency to turn on each other. But Mr. Scheer, um, who the campaign was not perfect. He's admitted that. But he won the largest number of votes for the federal conservatives in history, won the popular vote, uh, reduced Trudeau to minority, which most people thought impossible four years ago, picked up seats in most regions, had the best result in the history of Alberta for a federal party. I think that commends him well, and I just hope people will not give the Liberals what they want, which is internal uh, division. But four years ago was four years ago. Four years ago was before SNC. It was before the pictures of Trudeau emerged in blackface, right? I mean, to be fair, the, the context of the election changed. And I think my impression is people are judging him based on his outcome as compared to that fair enough. That uh, context. I, I, Why aren't you? Why do you, do you think he'll, he can beat Trudeau? Uh, yes, I do. And I, I think this is not dissimilar to the situation that Stephen Harper was in in 2004. Or for that matter, Dalton McKinty, when he when he lost his first election, or dozens of, of heads of government who lost their first elections, who learned a lot from those experiences, who grew as leaders, who became more effective in the end, who ended up winning. Um, but I would just say that uh, um, at the end of the day, people will ca cast their ballots. I would just at the review vote. I would just ask that they not do a full open um, sideshow in the meantime. Okay. And, and by the way, we had Andrew out to our our uh, conservative convention in Alberta. Uh, this past weekend, he got uh, standing ovations and a warm reception. So I think a lot of the noise is exaggerated. Or maybe coming from places where he didn't do as well as in Alberta. All right. Thanks, Premier Kenny. All Appreciate the best. your time. Thank you. Premiers from across the country were here meeting for the first time since the federal election, and they emerged from that meeting with consensus, having arrived at consensus on a number of issues, a handful of them. I want to go through some of the key takeaways. First of all, they came to agreement on the fiscal stabilization program. It's a mouthful, but it essentially means that the federal government would have a way of getting more money, transferring more money to economies like Alberta's and Saskatchewan's, which have been struggling recently. It also allows the feds and the provinces to avoid addressing any sort of issues with the equalization program and its configuration so it allows them to avoid that second they also agreed to ask the feds to change the planned environmental assessment rules that's commonly known what we call as bill c69 that's the law the government passed at the end of its last mandate to overhaul the way pipelines are approved and project like pipelines they came out with some very specific recommendations or sorry not so specific recommendations, just an agreement that they want to see the law amended in some way. And the federal government has signaled in the past that they are open to that. They also talked or came to agreement on boosting health care money from the federal government to the provinces. That's another key ask of Ottawa that emerged from this meetings. And they want to allow provinces, they want the federal government to allow provinces to opt out of pharmacare. That's one of the topics that we had a chance to ask Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil about. I spoke with him a little earlier today have a listen to that conversation hi premier mcneil nice to see you good to see you thanks very much for making time for our show it's great to have you on the program yeah, i appreciate it i wanted to start off with one of the uh, four items that came out of the communique from this meeting and particularly that of health care and the uh, the ask of the federal government that it increase the escalator so the the amount by which provinces kind of the extra money that you get for health care every year, that you want that to increase. In my conversations with federal officials, there did not seem to, at this point, be a willingness to do that. Are you hearing something different? No, we're, obviously with the uh, federal campaign, we're hoping the new government uh, will uh, take a look at how do we fund health care. Uh, when, when the program started, it, it was shared equally 50% 50, uh, 50 by each of us. Uh, for some provinces, below 20% now, uh, the federal government's contribution in delivering health care. It's just simply not enough to be able to ensure that we have the same standard of, of health care from one end of the country to the other. Have you had any conversations, though, with either a minister or the prime minister in which they have signaled a, a, any kind of openness to increasing the amount of money they send your way? No, obviously the, in the campaign they, they talked about that $6 billion. Uh, we believe that's not enough. We need to increase that. I have an opportunity to meet the Prime Minister next week. Uh, we'll certainly be raising the issue with him. I know 
a number of my colleagues uh, who have been meeting with him have ra raised the issue of ensuring that we continue to increase uh, the, the federal contribution to health care. I found the way in which some of the premiers addressed the issue in the press conference following the meeting interesting in that they were sort of saying, look, we're in interested in PharmaCare and, and some kind of program that the feds put forth, but first we need to see more money to address the issues at hand. Is that a position you share? It, it's, it was unanimous in the room. We need to make sure that we actually have the proper amount of funding to deliver the services that we currently have. Uh, we need uh, the federal government to step up, uh, to, to play a, a bigger role in how we fund the current uh, uh, health care delivery model that we have. I think all premiers, I know I'll sort of speak for myself, I certainly want to engage the national government on a pharma care program, uh, but the details of that will determine uh, what, uh, you know, what the role Nova Scotia will play in it. And, and we need to make sure that uh, it doesn't turn out like uh, current health care where it started out at 50 cent dollars and now we're down below 20 cents. Uh, so we need to make sure that if we're going to have a program, it's sustainable in the long term. Is that the fear though, shared in the room, that the feds will commit to some sort of universal program and not adequately fund it? I think, th I think there's a number of unknowns around it. So what does the formulary look like? What drugs are covered? Uh, uh, certain provinces, all of us have some a form of a pharma care now. We, we in Nova Scotia have one for seniors plus a family pharma care program. How does the federal government's contribution into that? What does that look like? Uh, do all of the drugs that we currently cover, would they still be covered? All of those details would be part of that. And yes, of course, uh, we want to make sure that the national government uh, uh, contributes uh, its fair share of, uh, of any new program. I want to switch gears and ask you about an issue that a lot of Canadians are thinking about right now because it's about one year since uh, since uh, the two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, were detained in China. You've actually visited China. In the meantime, you recently came back from a trip there. Uh, what was the, the purpose of your trip? Well, we were in uh, to continue to grow our export opportunities, uh, build the tourism ties with China. We. Uh, in 2013, we're doing about $180 million. Today, we export over a billion dollars worth of product into China. Uh, so let's continue to build on, on that economic relationship. Uh, we also are, are building on a cultural relationship. We currently have a, uh, an art exhibit from Nova Scotia in, in China and a couple of uh, their galleries in Guangdong province. Uh, uh, so we're looking to continue to build that connection. The opposition, uh, members of the opposition in your province criticized you for taking that trip at a time when the relationship between our two countries is at a terrible point. What's your response to that? Listen, uh, I continue to go out and promote uh, our province looking for new trade opportunities and economic opportunities. We support the national government as it works uh, with the Chinese government to, to build, a, uh, to put the relationship back together as they deal with the challenges facing them. But we can't sit back uh, as a province uh, and, and not go into uh, this large marketplace looking for an opportunity to sell our products. It's economic Even when they're treating us the way they are? It's economic development, but at no time ever in our history does isolation or protectionism help and work? Uh, so to me, going in and doing what we're doing, continue to build those relationships, uh, continue to have dialogue. Uh, the uh, federal government representatives were part of that. We, we uh, spoke with the new ambassador, uh, Martin, as well, about the issues, uh, not only the issues facing us, but the role that Canada has. Uh, so uh, for the opposition to say, let's stay home, uh, is, is very short-sighted and more of a political conversation than the reality of what you need to do and that's go in and have dialogue and have conversation. The things that we see in, in, in Hong Kong today that you're seeing take place in Hong Kong, that's because the young people in those communities have seen a different form of government and they, won't, and they don't want to go back. Uh, that's why we need to continue to go in to uh, show uh, what we have as a, as a country, we as a province, and quite frankly, we'll open up our province. So 41% of our international students come from China and we want to grow that. As you're having that conversation and those dialogues, did you raise the issue of the two Canadians who are detained? Yeah, that came up in the meeting that I was in with Consul General as well. We were meeting with the Governor. Uh, it was a part of that conversation. Uh, she raised it and, and we supported her. Uh, at the same time, as I've said every time I've been in, uh, both uh, the citizens from uh, China and citizens from Canada going into China need to uh, feel uh, uh, the comfort that they will be able to move in and about our respective countries freely uh, without being detained. Do you think that that feeling exists given what's happened? Uh, listen, I, I certainly felt uh, in my time in that uh, you know China wants a resolution with Canada. Uh, is my view. I think. What that, gave you that feeling? Uh, in the conversations that we had, I've been in this my second time this year being in. Uh, quite honestly. Did you raise it the first time because the federal government was saying that you didn't? Yeah, we uh, each time each we time? go in, we raise the issue about uh, 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 people moving freely with inside of our countries. Uh, that's just the reality of what we need to be able to continue to, to communicate. 
Uh, the have national you raised the issue, though, of those two detained Canadians? Every yeah, time they, you were they were. We were in uh, both times that I've been in okay. uh, since then. Uh, but it's the national government. Uh, it needs to go in and have that conversation. It needs to continue to make that. My job is to grow the economy of Nova Scotia. Uh, and that's but don't what you, gonna, as a Canadian, as a, as, a, as a representative of this country, isn't it also incumbent on you as a politician, as someone who represents you know, the political system in this country, to uh, try and do what you can to help arrive at a solution for these, these two men? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I continue to go in continue to build those relationships, continue to make sure that we open up lines of communications not only for goods and services but in dialogue. Uh, we're the only Canadian province that actually has a relationship with the Chinese Embassy here in Canada. Uh, we continue to make sure uh, that not only we deal with the issues that are currently going on but how do we continue to build a long-term uh, stable uh, relationship for the economy of Nova Scotia. Do you think, based on your conversations, there will be a resolution to this without the case of Meng Wanzhou being resolved? Do you think that's necessary for there to be a re resolution? Uh, I, w I would say uh, China's having a hard time understanding why Canada is between, uh, between uh, the United States and China when it comes uh, to this issue. Uh, I think that'll all be part of, uh, of an ongoing conversation. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Premier McNeil. Pleasure to have you on. Appreciate Thank your time. Thank you. Welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics. We're coming to you live from the outskirts of Toronto, where the country's premiers spent the day meeting. It's the first meeting since the federal election back in October. And this meeting looked a whole lot different than the one they held after the federal election in 2015. There are far more conservative premiers sitting around the table. In fact, about a year ago, many of those premiers posed for the cover of McLean's. The headline on that cover, well, it read, The Resistance. There was a more congenial tone as the premiers emerged from the meeting this afternoon, and they had this to say about that now famous cover. That wasn't uh, my word. I don't think it was the word of any of my colleagues, but, but to McLean's magazine. That cover speaks to the power of Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if the federal government will listen to the unified voices of premiers from uh, across this beautiful country on economic competitiveness, take steps to you know, make the improvements that we've recommended, uh, they can lessen the resistance remarkably. Well, uh, again, uh, none of us knew that was going to be on the front page or, or none of us would have even taken the picture. I was in Regina for that, uh, for that particular uh, photo. And well, I firstly, I want to say I wore a blue suit today, so maybe McLean's will Photoshop me in, too. <laughs> um, the, the, don't pay no attention to the orange polka dots on the tie. Uh, so what do we make of the lack of resistance, and what does it mean the feds are up against? Time, of course, for the power panel. Joining us, I believe, from Toronto is Brad Levine of Council Public Affairs. Rachel Curran, former senior policy advisor to Stephen Harper, now with Harper and Associates, joins us from Ottawa. And Yolande James, former Quebec Liberal Cabinet Minister, I think is with us from Quebec City, correct me if I'm wrong. No, Montreal, Montreal. <laughs> Montreal, my, my, Montreal, my bad. And next to me here is JP Tasker, the CBC's own JP Tasker. Hi, everybody. Hey, Vashti. Hey. Nice to see you, JP. Why don't I start with you because you've been sure. in the room with me. I mean, there is the reason that I, I wanted to show that clip of the resistance is because you could easily denote a change in tone today right across oh, the board, right? Like yeah. it was a, they had a specific ask of the federal government but also the way in which they were making that ask is a real kind of departure. Yeah. Well they were all united I mean that's the thing that really struck me all 13 provincial and territorial premiers were on the same page about some issues that they might historically not be on the same page for I mean Jason Kenney really proved today that he's a masterful politician because he got basically everything he wanted including from some progressive premiers who might not necessarily want to sign on to things like improving in their words or amending Bill C-69. I'm surprised BC Premier John Horgan agreed to do that because obviously he's been an opponent of things like the Trans Mountain Pipeline and future pipeline development or oil pipelines that will go through his province, something that would be considered by the federal government under Bill C-69. Kenny got all he wanted on that. He got all he wanted on the fiscal stabilization program. They took the talk of equalization off the table and said focusing on this little known program that really could be a big boon for places like Alberta and Saskatchewan, Newfoundland and Labrador. I was amazed and I think Doug Ford said it best perhaps today. He said, well, it might seem like we're capitulating of sorts, I'm paraphrasing, but capitulating to Jason Kenney and Scott Moe from the Western provinces. But we could all be there. We could all be in this position in the future. We could need other premiers to come on side for us when we're facing 
big budget holes. That's why we're standing up for Western Canada today. And obviously, Doug Ford is trying to present himself as Captain Canada as he tries to improve his image or his standing, I think, in Ontario, bringing the country together, being that unifying force, having it here in his backyard in Mississauga, and really tackling some of the big issues the country is facing right now. Yolan, Premier Kenny, in our interview, noted that there was no resistance like around the table, especially where the fiscal stabilization program is concerned. And for our viewers, that's essentially a way to get more money from the federal government if they amend the program uh, that will address the sort of struggling economies, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan. They, they came to consensus on that, and Premier Kenny said it wasn't hard to do. What does that tell you? Well, it, it says to me that there was certainly a willingness on behalf of all the premiers to come mm -hmm. out of this meeting, and again, initiated by Doug Ford, who really has changed tones uh, from the post-election. Um, there really was a willingness to do that, given that, I mean, as we set up the meeting, even coming into it uh, last week, it was not going to be an easy thing. I think for a lot of us, it's easier to make the list of the things that the premiers don't agree on, Bill 21, um, equalization, um, uh, uh, whether it's um, even, um, I just drew a blank there on the, the pipelines, obviously. Um, it's easier to make that list and to, to come then to find the things that they agree on. And I think there was in tone, but certainly in terms of wanting to um, be uh, pragmatic in this new uh, reality of a minority government to send a message. That being said, it's not going to be easy just taking to John Paul's um, um, talk to with respect to Bill 69. Yes, um, um, certainly that could be a win for Mr. Kenny to see that in the press release today. But uh, look at Bill 69. I mean, Quebec, whether it's this government one or the previous Liberal one, will also was against uh, Bill 69, but not necessarily mm -hmm. for the same reasons. It was more of a jurisdictional thing, uh, so that they could keep jurisdiction in, in an instance where another provinces wanted to pass a pipeline that they could stop it. So, I mean, today was certainly a good day for the Council of Federation, but it certainly doesn't evacuate um, in the medium to long term um, uh, issues that they have, uh, obviously, difference of opinion on and how they will settle that. Well, we'll see. Yeah, it's interesting. It's good to note also that, I mean, for example, on Bill C-69, it's one line in the communique that essentially acknowledges that they all want to see improvements to it, but the specifics of what those improvements will be are not detailed. And, I, and, I, and they have, we have not received any details from the federal government. They say they're open to, you know, amending it, at least amending the impact of it through the implementation process, but we don't know to what degree or, or any of that stuff. Brad, let me bring you in. I wanted to get your thoughts on the sort of deflated resistance or the, or the muted resistance, <laughs> the change resistance, and if you, what, what you think is behind that. Is it sort of an acknowledgement that the new reality is a, a minority government led by Justin Trudeau and they've just got to figure out a way to uh, best be effective in that, or is there something else there? What do you think? No, I, I completely agree that the tone was, was quite surprising from just a, a weeks or months ago that you would not have seen, maybe you would not have predicted that the, that the premiers would get along so well. But, but since the federal election, and so here you've got a minority federal parliament in Ottawa. You've got a, you know, with respect to Mr. Scheer, a weakened Mr. Scheer who's kind of on the ropes on his own leadership. The, the Council of the Federation could actually become a relevant counterbalance to the Trudeau <laughs> minority parliament. Yeah. If it stays t together, if it stays united, it is irrelevant if they're fighting over things like C uh, Bill 21, the, the Quebec law, which there's qu uh, lots of opposition. And Queen's Park just passed a motion unanimously uh, to join the, any Supreme Court, future Supreme Court uh, 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 intervention against that bill. Leave all that aside. Let's find a handful of things that we can be united on. Let's come out united where everyone feels like they've got something there. And then from this point forward, not only there's some very good stuff in there, the, the increased money to health care uh, is very good. The, the component about the North having, you know, the three territorial leaders getting their uh, kind of uh, issues put on equal balance with things like health care and economic development. So very, very good. Every, all the first ministers can leave here feeling good. And now that the Council of the Federation plays a credible role, a legitimate role in future public policy making, and we're going to be following what they say because they handled themselves, I think, quite, uh, quite effectively today. 
Rachel, I'm wondering what you think as well as someone who's, you know, been in government when, when, the, when the premiers used to meet. I noticed from covering it, I thought they were more, and to Brad's point, more disciplined than they've ever been before on avoiding the stuff they don't agree on and really, truly zoning in on the few items that they do agree on. Like, I've, I've never seen them be that disciplined before. I don't know what you think. Yeah, that struck me also. This is one of the shortest communiques I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> it was very short. There was a remarkable <laughs> degree of uh, focus in it and a remarkable degree of unity. Uh, and look, I agree with Brad. Uh, working together, the premiers can be in a really effective counterbalance to the Trudeau government. I, look, I also agree with y Yolande. Like, this isn't the end to all of the problems between them uh, that they need to resolve. Uh, but I think they're accepting the fact that we just went through an election campaign, the current federal government was re-elected, uh, and they need to get stuff done. Uh, they're also, I think, acknowledging the reality that they aren't going to see much leadership from the federal level. Uh, and so the premiers have got to take it upon themselves to advance their own priorities. Uh, and I think they've hit on exactly the right ones. Economic competitive, uh, competitiveness is the issue that everyone is worried about. How do we secure Canada's long-term prosperity? Uh, our health care system is in crisis. It needs structural reform, yes. It also needs a lot more money, and they're asking for that. Uh, so, so look, they're, they're hitting on all of the really important topics. In fact, they into the topics that were not addressed in the most recent election campaign. Uh, and so to, to see this sort of bottom-up federalism at work, I think, is really encouraging. I hope we see more of it. Thank you so much to our power panel this evening. Thanks, Thanks to Yolan James, Brad Levine, Rachel Curran, and J.P. Tasker. It was shockingly uh, easy. Uh, there was some advanced work. Uh, Premier Mo and I worked the, the phones with our colleagues beforehand explaining this. Uh, and I think that Premier Ball probably helped explain it to, to some of his colleagues on the East Coast. Um, but I really want to thank especially uh, Quebec and Ontario um, for, for understanding the situation because it's hard to get anything through the Council of the Federation without the two big provinces being on site. Welcome back to Power and Politics. That was Alberta Pre Premier Jason Kenney speaking earlier on the show about how, from his perspective, it was easy to reach consensus on a number of the issues that were eventually decided by the premiers around the table. How surprising is that level of consensus, and how likely is the federal government to comply with the list of demands issued today? Time now for the Premier's League. Joining us from Toronto, former Premier of Ontario, Bob Ray. He was Premier from 1990 to 1995. He's also the former interim leader of the Federal Liberal Party and now host of the Political Stripes podcast. And in our Ottawa studios, Premier of PEI from 2007 to 2015, Robert Giz. He's now President and CEO of the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association. Hello to both of you. Nice to see you. Uh, I should acknowledge for our viewers first, if you see things being ripped apart behind me, it's because the the uh, everything is the, the meeting has concluded and everybody is taking all the, the props down, like the flags and stuff that the premiers were talking in front of. So if you see that, that's what it is. Uh, Mr. Ray, I'm going to start with you. Let's, let's start with the list of demands. I think it probably came as much of a shock to you as me that the premiers are asking the federal government for more money, and they all agreed on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's... Um... That's the easiest thing uh, for the provinces to agree on. I, I don't think any of the things that they agreed on were particularly surprising, given uh, the financial situation in some provinces and, and given an ongoing um, view of the provinces that they're, ne they're ne not getting enough money on health care transfers. Those are pretty deeply seated, shared views of, of, uh, of a great many uh, provinces. I, I, think, I actually think that the... The critical thing now is for the finance ministers to meet and for the first ministers to meet with the prime minister. And I, I think the federal government will be watching and listening carefully and saying, well, here's some things we could do. These things are more difficult. And it really just depends, I think, on how much give and take there is uh, between this list of, of demands from the provinces, if you like, um, and what the federal government can really do uh, within a framework of, of some degree of fiscal responsibility. Mr. Giz, if you could, from based on your experience, take us into the room or what the room is like on a day like today. How do the premiers go about uh, negotiating? What ends up on that communique? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I think 
a lot of the work gets done by the bureaucrats prior to the meetings. Uh, so, you know, they would start to draft up a communique. The premiers would have a call in advance where they talk about issues that are important to them. Uh, then the bureaucrats would bore down into those issues and see where there's some commonality. Um, and then uh, they would brief their premiers. And as you heard from Premier Kenny, uh, he made some calls. Uh, Premier Mo made some calls. Premier Ball made some calls to try and bring that all together uh, to uh, be able to come up with a communique today that they would agree on. So when they got into the room today, I would say, you know, probably 75 to 80 percent was already uh, kind of decided. Probably some got decided last night uh, over dinner. Uh, and then during the meeting today, uh, they were able to find those areas of commonality and, uh, and uh, agree on those points that they wanted to take to the federal government. Is it difficult, Mr. Ray, to find agreement on those types of points? Like, and I'm asking only because it seemed to me just for, and you have much more experience in a different kind of it, but from covering these, the communiques are often longer and less to the point, I guess, is, is, is sort of one way to describe it. Like these were, it was very easy to digest. It was four quick things. Yeah. Um, is that normal, do you think, or what, what do you make of it? Well, I, th I think it's a reflection that, that this is a real conversation that's going on. I mean, I think, and you, you've, your interview with Premier Mo. I mean, I think uh, the fact that equalization, uh, the equalization demand, the demand for an instant change in the formula, which had been the, the demands of Mr. Premier Mo and of, of Premier Kenny, um, I think any conversation among the premiers would reveal that um, that isn't going to work because equalization is one of those things that takes from some and gives to others. And if there's a perception that, you know, the pot is staying the same and some are going to get more, that means some get less. So I think they, they, that's a no-win game for the premiers. So that, that was put aside in favor of uh, focusing on this question of, well, what can we do to stabilize those provinces who've seen a, a sudden and dramatic drop in revenue and are facing a particular challenge? I don't think anybody's going to say that's an unreasonable demand. I only wish that... <laughs> People have been around in 1990, 1991. I mean, it, 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 there are lots of situations which, you know, have a lot of resonance for me because these are real situations. When you see a dramatic drop in revenue, it affects your bottom line. It affects your ability to finance things. Um, and I think if the Federation can respond positively to that, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But so I think the fact that it's a, a fairly neat package is not an accident. It's a result of a lot of discussion that's taken place over several weeks among the premiers. And I think the federal government is going to, is going to want to respond in a constructive way, as, um, as uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland did this afternoon. Uh, but when you get down into the details, it gets a little tougher. Yeah, that's where I want to pick up with Mr. Giz. How likely or, or what kind of response do you anticipate from the federal government on this? And, and I'll let our viewers know that the premiers are supposed to meet with the prime minister uh, early next year. Yeah, well, this is a, I personally think, a great time uh, for collaboration in our country. Uh, first of all, you've got a prime minister uh, who is willing to meet with the premiers, who wants to collaborate, who wants to take on big projects uh, that a previous prime minister uh, didn't necessarily want to do. Uh, you also have a change in the tone now that we're out of the federal political cycle amongst the premiers. You saw it from Premier Higgs, from uh, uh, the Premier of Ontario, Premier Ford, uh, where they changed their tone after the federal uh, election. But I do want to rewind a little bit just to give a little bit of a history lesson here, that back in 2012, the premiers met at that time in Victoria. Uh, and we met at that time in Victoria because we were preparing ourselves for the end of the 2004 health accord. So we were all ready to start uh, a new accord uh, in 2014. And we were preparing at that time uh, to sit down uh, and come up with a game plan to deal with the federal government. Well, the night before we met, uh, the prime minister at the time, Prime Minister Harper, went on CBC News uh, on The National with Peter Man Mansbridge and announced that he was going to implement a 3% increase to health transfers. There will be no negotiations. So fast forward to today, and I think that this is an incredible opportunity uh, where the premiers today do want to sit down and, and talk with the federal government, where the federal government is willing to listen and work with the provinces. Uh, so hopefully we can see some 
good changes come about uh, to our healthcare system because we have an aging population, our demographics are changing, healthcare professionals uh, are changing the way that they do their delivery and the way that they work. Uh, and quite frankly, it should have been a debate we had in 2013-14 that didn't happen. But now I think we're, we have a prime minister who does want to work with the premiers and premiers that are coming to the table, in my opinion, from what I've seen today, uh, with a very positive attitude. Yeah, my understanding is that it was initially promised by the Harper government to be implemented in 2017. The Liberals adopted it, and they've promised in the last campaign to continue with that escalator. The ask today from the Premiers was very specific, and it also is, I should mention, like you say, Mr. Giz, not new. They have been asking for an increase to that escalator before. They want it to, to be around 5.2%. How key, Mr. Ray, is the whole health care piece, and how likely do you think it is that the federal government will reconsider that escalator? I think what the federal government wants is what I think a lot of Canadians want, and that is that uh, uh, pharmacare is an important issue uh, for the whole country. It's the one area of health care, one, one of the main er areas of expenditure in health care for Canadians that's left out of our universal coverage. So I, I do think that there may well be uh, the opportunity for a very creative uh, and very substantial package uh, that would involve uh, looking at the escalator on health care overall and looking at ways in which um, pharmacare coverage can be increased with provincial uh, participation. And I think that's going to be a very exciting and interesting negotiation. But it will be a negotiation. I think, and I hear I speak with my former Premier's hat on, the days of unilateral federalism are over. You can't have one level of government dictating to another how things are going to work. We live in a federal country. The first Premier's Conference in 1884, I wasn't there, uh, but I'm told by those who were, that it was all about this question of how's the Federation supposed to work? It's supposed to be a collaboration. Can we get back to those days, these days now, of cooperative federalism? I hope so. I hope it isn't naive to think so. And I think we've seen a little bit of easing off of the rhetoric from uh, some of the Conservative Premiers, and I'm hoping that there will be an opportunity for a more constructive engagement. Only time will tell. Only time will tell. Thank you very much to both of you for your time and your insights this evening. Thanks to former Premier of Ontario, Bob Ray, and former Premier of PEI, Robert Giz. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.